Hey everyone, let's get back to our lesson. Just like Rose said, we're also going to be talking about DNA structure today. So let's jump right in. Now this is something you should be familiar with based on our previous lesson. So right, so this is a nucleotide, uh, and of course we have the phosphate group here, which is attached to the ribose sugar, and then here we have the nitrogenous base. In this case, this is an adenine or A. Okay, so let me clarify something. Um, DNA can be single-stranded, um, single-stranded SS, or double-stranded, or DS. Now, in the context of cell biology or molecular biology, traditionally, when we just say uh, DNA, it's almost always referring to the uh, double-stranded variant, okay? So, single-stranded DNA does exist, okay? But it's less common and less rele relevant. So from now on, unless I specify, when I say DNA, I mean the double-stranded variant. Well, you'll see what I mean soon. So anyway, how are these nucleotides as a whole, how do they come together and, um, and connect to form DNA? Two ways, actually. One of the, one of the ways is that by uh, linking up the phosphate groups. And uh, so these phosphate groups actually form pretty critical uh, critical connections and then the other method is by a base pairing which is basically um, connecting these nitrogenous bases with ones on a complementary strand first let's take a look at the phosphate linking that I mentioned here we have the four types of nucleotides designated by their bases so up here this will be adenine or A followed by thymine T this here would be guanine G and finally, we have cytosine C. Now, if you look at how these nucleotides are connected, the common link seems to be these phosphate groups. Indeed, um, the phosphate linking, this is what I mean, when each of these phosphate groups link up the ribose, forming what we call, so we call this a uh, phosphate backbone. Okay, and this is also a good point, a uh, good area to point out the directionality of DNA. Now let's take a look at the ends of this short strand. So here we have the phosphate group as kind of the ending of this strand. Well, there would be more technically up here, but let's just assume this is the end. So this ending here will be a phosphate group, and down here, uh, the end looks like to be an oxygen. So we have this asymmetry, asymmetry at the ends, and this asymmetry is what defines directionality. By conventional numbering, we can go through uh, naming the carbon on carbons on these ribose. So this will be carbon one here. This will be two. Uh, three will be here. Four will be here, and finally the fifth carbon will be right here. Now. Because we have this phosphate group connecting to the fifth carbon, we call uh, the end. So when DNA, when we see this at the, when we see this phosphate group at the end of a DNA, we call this the five prime end. Okay, and kind of this by a similar fashion, if we were to name the ribose down here at the other end of the DNA, one, two, three, four, five. We see the oxygen group is connected to the third carbon, and thus we call this end the three prime end. Okay, right. So this is basically the directionality of DNA, and it's really kind of just defined by this phosphate backbone. How DNA is linked in the kind of the support, the support structures. What I like to what what I like to call it the foundation. Now let's move on to base pairing, the other type of connection I mentioned. Base pairing is what makes double-stranded DNA, well, double-stranded. So if you can imagine, we have two strands of DNA and they can come together and their bases can form favorable, attractive interactions, basically uh, hydrogen bonding with one another. So the first two of the base pairing is guanine and cyto cytosine, otherwise it's known as uh, simply as a GC pairing. GC pairing. Um, so only G can pair with C, and that's because of the number of hydrogen bond 
um, bonding, uh, hydrogen bonding donators and acceptors. So let's take a look. So we have a partially positive charge here at the hydrogen, right? And then here we have a partially negative charge and a partially uh, negative charge at the oxygen as well. So this is just because, you know, nitrogen and oxygen are more electronegative. And uh, so we need a partner that's basically the exact opposite. And uh, so, so lo and behold, though, we have guanine that basically completely, completely satisfies this. And it mirrors uh, the charges because the oxygen here has a partial negative charge. Hydrogens, of course, have a partial positive charge. And this results in these hydrogen bonding forming between these two bases. Let me just write that down. Hydrogen bonding. Right, so this is what we call a pretty much a uh, perfect match. So it's basically the same concept when it comes to adenine and uh, adenine and thymine uh, base pairing, or simply we just call this AT pairing. So we have a partial positive charge up here in this oxygen. Oh, sorry, partial negative charge at this oxygen in thymine. I think here we have a partial positive charge, of course, at the uh, at the hydrogen, and then the we need a partner with the exact opposite charges, and of course adenine fits that perfectly. So we have hydrogen up here, which confers a partially positive charge, and a nitrogen down here, which confers a partially negative charge. And here we so we form two hydrogen bonds. You might be wondering, what about this hydrogen down here? There is a hydrogen here, and so why can't it form a uh, hydrogen bond with this oxygen? Well, sadly, it's just too far away. Um, normally, a hydrogen bond is between 2.6 to uh, 3.1 angstroms. So... Um, the problem is, oh, I can't spell angstroms. Okay, so yeah, so this is normally what uh, the distance for an optimal hydrogen bond is. And sadly, this is just way too far, so this cannot happen. And here we have the complete picture. Phosphate groups link up the, um, the riboses in the, in, the, um, in the nucleotides, forming, these phosphate back, forming the phosphate backbones. And then in the middle, we have the uh, GC pairing and the AT pairings. And remember, the important part is that G, G, of course, G always pairs with C, and then A always pairs with T, but also is that we have three hydrogen bonds for GC pairing and only two for AT pairing. And so the um, AT pairing, these, uh, these bases, is uh, slightly weaker uh, because they, have, they only have two hydrogen bonds. And this is relevant uh, later on. Okay, so anyway, because double-stranded DNA has, well, um, two strands, I know, pretty obvious, so that means that each terminal, we actually have both a 5' prime and 3' prime in. So here is already indicated. So here on this strand, we have a 5' prime in. So in its complementary strand, it's always going to be a 3' prime ending here. Same thing with the other side. So 5' prime at that end, at, at this end, so on this strand, the other and must be a three prime ending, which means this complementary uh, strand must have a five prime ending. And uh, that's basically uh, kind of the uh, overall bigger picture. This is a simplified view of a, D of a short DNA sequence. Traditionally, DNA is always written starting from the five prime end, ending at the three prime end. And uh, often, the bottom or complementary strand is left out because knowing what the top strand is we can easily easily figure out the sequence of the complementary strand based on the base pairing rules and here we see the filled in complementary strand to the top strand and since it's complementary we know at the beginning here um, this is the three prime end and here we'll be ending at the five prime n. So, is uh, this what DNA looks like? A ladder, basically? Well, no, not quite. In this configuration, actually, DNA is quite unstable. Now, why is that? Well, two main reasons. First of all, this phosphate backbone, which is 
basically uh, here indicated by this uh, black line is uh, highly negatively charged, right? There's negative charges dispersed all, all, the, all the way around this phosphate background on both strands, actually. So if you can imagine, the phosphates, um, these negative charges, do not want to be stacked up on one another like this, right? This is a, a, a lot of repulsive forces. This is very unfavorable. Um, even though the, uh, the, the middle part, the base pairing, are very favorable hydrogen attractive forces. The backbone is highly unstable because of all these negative forces right on top of one another. And uh, second of all, the backbone, because it is charged, it actually loves water. So the backbone is quite hydro, uh, hydrophilic, is what we like to call it. So the backbone is hydrophilic, which loves water. But the middle part, these nitrogenous, nitrogenous bases, actually do not like water at all. They're quite um, what we like to call hydrophobic. Uh, let me write that down. Hydrophobic. Uh, hydro. This is a. Yeah, that's 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 a H. Sorry, I. Terrible handwriting. Anyways, um, so the bases, nitrogenous bases, are actually hydrophobic. Now, you might be wondering, wait, that doesn't make sense. You said that there's hydrogen bonding, there's charges. No, actually, hydrogen bonding, there's no actual charges between those molecules. Just partial charges because of differences in electronegativity. The middle part, these bases are actually quite uh, quite neutral. So, because there's no real actual charge, um, it's actually quite hydrophobic and doesn't doesn't like water. So, how does DNA compensate for these two issues while keeping um, the favorable base pair interactions? Right. We want to have these base pairs, but at the same time, we don't want these negative charges to be so close to one another, um, and also avoid this hydrophobic hydrophilic issue. And so let's go ahead and take a look at DNA from a top-down perspective. So here we just have a kind of a um, cartoon or a, a illustration showing a top-down perspective of DNA. Here we, in the middle we have the nitrogenous space interactions, but the most important part we see these phosphates in the backbone. And if this wasn't twisted a little bit, we can definitely see in the regular ladder formation, the phosphate groups will be really right on top of one another, and that's really bad. But as you can see, if we start applying kind of a twist to the system, these phosphate groups will start to get um, a little bit far from each other. And so if we keep um, twisting this DNA, um, here we, we see, if we, so we apply more of a twist, we can see these phosphate groups becoming further and uh, further away from each other, thus minimizing, minimizing uh, the uh, unfavorable, unfavorable repulsive forces. Right, we're keeping these negative charges away from each other as much as possible. Now, of course, this isn't a hundred percent perfect, but um, this is definitely better than nothing. And so if we keep twisting DNA, uh, we'll, we'll end up in this helical uh, structure. So this is what um, DNA looks like in its most stable form, the uh, double helix. It's called a double helix because, again, there's two strands in DNA, and each of them is actually a helix. Um, so this conformation, again, allows DNA to kind of mitigate the the you know, the negative charges in the backbone from stacking up uh, on top of one another because of the phosphates to minimize this, to minimize this uh, bad, uh, kind of unfavorable interaction, this repulsive force, while maintaining the good in interactions uh, of the hydrogen bonds for the base pairs. And at the same time, this twisting, this helix structure, actually minimizes, minimizes the surface area. Now, why is that important? Well, I mentioned earlier that the middle part of the DNA is actually hydrophobic. Well, this minimizes the surface area, so actually water becomes um, less problematic. So now we have less exposure of water towards the, uh, towards the center part, which is hydrophobic. So less exposure to 
water. And here we just have another look at the helical structure of DNA. But what's interesting is that we see asymmetry in the double helix. So here we have, uh, during this twist, here we have uh, kind of a smaller, smaller gap, right? Kind of smaller gaps here, while we have larger gaps in these areas. Well, there's actually names for these gaps. So the larger gaps are called the, uh, the major groove and the smaller gaps are called the minor grooves. Now, um, don't worry about what these means and uh, what these mean and what the implications of these. We're going to talk about this much later on, but just kind of be aware of that. And of course, the middle, we just have the uh, nitrogenous bases, the ATs and the GCs, and they're pairing with one another. Remember, GC, we have the three hydrogen bonds, and AT we have two. And this brings us to our summary. So what have we learned today? Well, we learned that nucleotides connect to one another by forming a phosphate backbone and also by base pairing. And this, will, this is what forms a DNA. Now, this base pairing themselves uh, involves AT and GC pairs through hydrogen bonds. And AT always has uh, two hydrogen bonds these pairs, while uh, GC pairs always have uh, GC pairs always have three hydrogen bonds. And lastly, we learned that DNA adopts a helical structure, and it's for two main purposes. Number one, it minimizes the unfavorable interphosphate repulsions, right, because the backbone is so negatively charged. While at the same time, time it satisfies the favorable base pairing in the middle. And finally the helical structure reduces the water contact for the hydrophob hydrophobic bases in the middle because the surface area is being reduced. So in our next lesson, we're going to go into a brief overview on proteins. I originally wanted to talk about DNA organization in cells and kind of um, maybe talk about a little bit about DNA replication, but I realized before I, I go into that, I need to introduce proteins else it might be a little bit confusing. Okay, well, that's it for today's lesson. Until next time, everyone, see you later.